welcome to VizMath. And thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank uh, those who uh, will listen to this recording later. Uh, we are very pleased today to actually have a special guest, uh, Dr. Arpan Smith. Uh, we'll be talking about citizen science, um, but in a, a special way in terms of uh, discussing the, the concept of super crunchers that is the topic for this week. Uh, as a preparation for that, and certainly you can do this out of order, um, Marge Robes and I prepared a um, video, and it is on the site. So you should take a look at that. Uh, there's some information there about what super crunching means and how uh, working with large data sets can really help inform us about the world around us. So um, I'm going to move this over to um, Arpan, um, but also let me say that uh, Carol Yeager is here, a co-facilitator for BizMath. And Mark Robeson is here, and then she'll be asking our friends some questions after his presentation. So thank you very much, Arf. Okay, thank you for the introduction, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, so um, today I'm going to be talking about a, a way of doing science that fundamentally relies upon the efforts of a large number of people, members of the public. And uh, for us, we we do this science on the web, so it's um, it's a web-based citizen science, if you like. And so, um, I run a collection of I run a software development for a collection of projects that come under the umbrella term uh, Zooniverse, and, and and I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of a walk through today of some of the projects that we've developed and why we think uh, citizen science, this kind of way of doing science, is is a good way of doing science. So, okay, so let's get started. So I think um, some of you may have heard this term citizen science in the past, but it may be a new one. Uh, another term that some people use sometimes is crowdsourcing, uh, where there's a crowd of people and sourcing the attention or efforts of a large number of people to do something. Uh, another, another kind of mode might be something called volunteer computing, where people share um, their computers to, to do, do stuff, maybe compute something like the SETI at Home project. It's a citizen science name, but I, I quite like this term. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of acronyms. Uh, the world doesn't need more acronyms, but keep building them. Uh, so PPSR is Public Participation in Scientific Research, and CBSR is uh, Community-Based Scientific Research. So there's all these terms that are kind of used interchangeably. And I think, let's go through some examples, see what I mean by each of these. I think probably the original crowdsourcing project was uh, were dictionaries. Uh, this is the Oxford English Dictionary, one of the sort of most famous dictionaries, and certainly uh, 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 in English-speaking world, world. And uh, and this is this is uh, uh, this was a book that was you know, developed by asking members of the public to submit words. Uh, so you know they, they literally collected up all the words that they thought were used in the English language and put them in a in a corpus. Um, Another kind of crowdsourcing is, is the, the, the kind of stuff that happens in ornithology. So in, uh, the, in the UK, there's the RSPB's once yearly event called the Big Garden Bird Watch, but there's actually a much bigger project that happens in the US. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology have a project called eBird, where they ask members of the public to submit sightings of birds. And, and, and the important thing about um, something like the Cornell Lab's eBird project is that this is the only way that they can really achieve this science. They have to solicit lots of observations of uh, lots of sightings of birds, put them into a large database, and only when that database comes together as a large collection of records can they actually do the science that they need to. They need to, they're trying to work out migratory patterns that are maybe changing because of the climate change, or, or new species coming, coming into North America. So, you know, only the only way to achieve this, this kind of science is to have a very large number of people submitting a large number of observations. And so it's, it's really data-driven science, but it also, you know, it's really impractical to, to fund this as a kind of traditional science project. They have hundreds of thousands of people submitting observations. So this is really crowdsourcing at its best, I think. Um, this volunteer computing idea, I think, I think today I'm not going to talk much more about this other than to say that I think you know, there's these programs uh, uh, that are uh, um, typically run on this platform called. Uh, oh, I seem to have gone back to slide one. That's weird. Um, there are these programs that run on um, 
on a platform called uh, Boink, and it's a distributed computing platform. So you can share compute resources with um, with, um, with with scientists, and you run typically run a screensaver on your computer. I would I think this is subtly different from from this kind of citizen science. I would uh, I'm going to talk about today because here you're just donating the um, uh, um, you're, you're donating your um, uh, CPU of your machine rather than your actual brain. Actually, somebody's asking, did this evolve out of CERN? I think, yeah, I think the, the original, the original Boink project was set here at home, and that came from, um, from uh, uh, Berkeley Laboratory. And CERN, I think, have been using it for some of the particle physics that they've been doing. So, yeah, I mean, it's a way of distributing computing. A, a, a kind of interesting midway between um, this uh, um, mode of uh, using a computer, but also asking the people's attention, is a project called Fold It. This is a screen capture from a, it's a game where you basically fold proteins in a game, and, and this relies upon a numerical model that's running on your computer. So there's a model. What we're looking at here is a big protein. And these things, these things are hard to visualize. Um, they're hard to uh, uh, work out how they're folding, and so. Um, the the uh, the game on your computer it is continually measuring the energy of the molecule. It does a a a, a, um, a kind of a coarse molecular modeling calculation, um, and then the the citizen scientist kind of manipulates the drags around the molecule, tries to fold it, and they uh, they they change the structure and the score changes as they go. And so this is a combination of both human and kind of uh, machine compute together produce this. Um, amazing, amazing project that actually produces very, very good science results, very good results about how these how these proteins fold. Um, and of course, there's something like Galaxy Zoo. So this is this is a project uh, that that we started in 2007. This is what it looks like today. And the, the task in Galaxy Zoo is to is to look at images of galaxies like this and to say something about the shape. So instead of instead of uh, asking people to submit their own data, Zooniverse is about Crowdsourcing human attention, so crowdsourcing um, people's brain cycles and asking them to put them towards a science goal. Now, the reason that Galaxy Zoo started was this telescope uh, in the in the top here. This is a robotic telescope called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, robotic telescope. It, it's in New Mexico and it systematically surveyed a large fraction of the northern sky. Uh, it took millions and millions of images and. Two of the images are shown uh, underneath the, uh, the telescope image here. Uh, it took millions of images of galaxies, stars, clusters, all sorts of all sorts of things. But um, the, the fundamental problem in, in, in astronomy is that um, astronomers like to know the, the shape of a galaxy. So the two we're looking at on the screen, there are two galaxies here. Uh, one of them is a spiral galaxy on the left. Uh, you can see this kind of spiral arms swirling pattern in it. And the one on the right is something called an elliptical galaxy. So it's just a kind of fuzzy round blob. And the difference in in the physics, the actual the history that these objects have been through, what's happened in their lifetimes, the, the ages of the stars, how many stars are forming in them, all of that information in a big part is encoded in the shape. The shape turns out to be very, very important um, when you're when you're trying to understand where, what processes the galaxy has gone through. So the first thing an astronomer does when they see a picture of the galaxy is they want to say what shape it is. And if you go back uh, something like uh, uh, um, 50 years, uh, we've lost the units on this plot, so I will say what they are. Uh, if we go back about 50 years, um, you you might, as a as a as a student, maybe during your program, your PhD program, you might look through something like 100 images during your whole PhD. You you'd probably use big photographic plates. You would probably get your Boss, your professor, to classify them. So, so this first, this first bar is say, say that's a hundred images. Um, if we go come forward to something like um, uh, 2007, instead of uh, just a just a single individual, your boss maybe classifying these images, maybe a whole team of people, team of professional astronomers, um, would be would be uh, uh, classifying the galaxies again by eye. And so this is now maybe something like 10,000 objects. So lots and lots of galaxies, but not, you know, still, still, still by human eye. So we had a, a, a student, a PhD student called Kevin Shavinsky, who was 
uh, in Oxford when, when we started this project, and he looked through 50,000 galaxies in, in a month, which is, which is a pretty impressive number. But, but even he was not capable of looking at the, uh, uh, the volume of images that were, were available from this robotic telescope. There were more than a million galaxies. And so so the, the four plots here, so on the left, it's pretty much disappeared into the noise. There's the 100 galaxies, then there's the 10,000, then the 50,000. And the last big bar on the right is, is this million galaxies. So yeah, did he did he sleep during his month? Uh, I suspect not. Uh, he he was pretty busy. But the first kind of result of Kevin's studies was that he really needed to look through the other 950,000, and quite reasonably he uh, he refused. So uh, so we made a website. It was called uh, it was called Galaxy View. It still is. It's, this is what it looked like in 2007, and we asked members of the public to help us with this task. It turns out that. Saying something about the shape of an object, a galaxy, actually isn't isn't that hard. Um, and so, so the, 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 this is what the website looked like. We showed an image of a galaxy. We're looking at here in the middle, and we said choose choose the galaxy profile, which is the closest match to the to the one uh, to the galaxy that you're looking at. So, if it was a spiral galaxy, we said which way of the spiral arm spinning. If it was an elliptical galaxy, you just hit the big elliptical galaxy button. And then if it was a star or merging galaxy, you, you, you clicked you clicked that button. And so what happened? Well, over the over the, the next uh, over the next uh, uh, um, uh, 48 hours, again we've lost units here, but I'll explain what they are. So our time is along the x-axis here, and number of classifications per hour is on the y-axis. So uh, over the, 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 the extent of this, uh, of this scale on the, on the x-axis here, the time scale is two days. So this is 48 hours we're seeing here. And the number of classifications per hour, um, well, you know what Kevin month is. You know that's 50,000 classifications. So we were, within about uh, two days, we were getting something like 50,000 classifications of these million galaxies every hour. So we were, an enormous amount of human effort was being put into classifying these shapes. So it was, it was, um, it was, it was an enormous volume of, of people that helped us with the, with the project. So over the next year, about 170,000 members of the public uh, contributed about 60 million analyses, so 60 million shape classifications. And if you think that there were about a million galaxies in that data set that they were looking at, that, you know, that's about 60 repeat classifications for each galaxy that was in that was in the database. So, so this is crowdsourcing uh, science. This is crowdsourcing human attention. Um, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the point I really wanted to, uh, uh, we seem to have missed some slides here. I don't know if, uh, there. We seem to have lost some. Let me see if I can find, I seem to have jumped around in order a little bit here. Let's see if I can find the slides I was looking for. Uh, I wanted to show you uh, the ordering seems to have gone a bit wrong. Uh, I was going to actually explain how we analyzed these results, but it's not crucial that I have those slides. It doesn't matter. The short version, the very short version is that with these, with these, um, with these slides, we can, I'm sorry, with these, uh, with these classifications, we can produce uh, good science. And in fact, we produce a lot of science. So there's, um, there's about 35 uh, peer reviewed publications that have come from from the from the data set so far. Um, broadly, how we treat these clicks that people provide is we say, okay, so the 60 people have maybe looked at an individual galaxy. So how do we know that what they said was any good? And so what we primarily do is we have a small number of objects in the database that have been seen by the science team, and then they will be uh, uh, they will they will be the the the, cl the classifications that the science team members have made will be compared with um, members of the public. So where two people, a science team member and a member of the public have seen the same galaxy, we can just make a straight comparison. We can say, okay, did this person agree with the scientist? And if they did, then they get the member of the public gets scored with a high, you know, a, a high, a high score. And then we can actually do uh, the same comparison between between um, those galaxies that a member of the public has seen and a scientist. Um, you can do the same comparisons between 
people, member of the public, members of the public with each other, if like a second and third generation comparison. I had some visuals to show this, and unfortunately the, the slides didn't import very well. Um, so it turns out that with with kind of careful um, with careful uh, um, um, monitoring of kind of how you're how you're uh, scoring people, you can actually produce um, a very nice, rich data set that turns out to be uh, richer than that, that if you just had a single person, single member of the science team producing these, producing these classifications. Because if you think about it, you have maybe 60 classifications for each galaxy. You start to build up a confidence measure for how certain you are about that classification. So did, uh, if 50 people out of 55 all said that it was a spiral galaxy, then you can be pretty sure that you do have a spiral galaxy, and it probably looks very spiral. Um, there's an interesting question about what that means astrophysically for something to be very spirally, but hopefully you can kind of understand that where the idea of sort of this confidence measure um, is in terms of having repeat classifications, not relying on a single individual to produce the uh, results. So here's another project that we built. This is what is called Old Weather. Uh, this is pretty different from Galaxy. This is a project that asks members of the public to help with another task that machines are bad at. So just like um, machines aren't as good as humans at classifying galaxies, machines are also fairly poor uh, optical character recognition of difficult handwriting. So it turns out that there are a lot of logbooks uh, from old uh, naval vessels, um, maybe merchant navy or, or, or the military, and Every day um, on these ships, they write down where they are and what the weather's like. But they write down the weather about six times a day, every, every four hours. And so we made a website called Old Weather. It took ships logs, book, ship logbooks from the First World War, from the Royal Navy, from about 300 ships. We put them in a website. And we asked members of the public to help us transcribe the information from these logs. So what we're looking at here is a, a screen grab from the website. Uh, the ship we're looking at is HMS New Zealand, which also uh, 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 was active in the First World War. So we're in 1919 here, so we're nearly 100 years ago. This ship uh, actually was um, did circumnavigation during the First World War, so it sailed all the way around the world I think, a couple of times. Um, but you can see here that there's wind speed, wind direction, a code for the weather, so that's whether it's cloudy or raining, there's barometric pressure, and there's air and sea temperature. It turns out that this information is extremely valuable uh, for, for climate simulations of today because what as climate scientists like to do is try and work out if the weather has been changing dramatically over the last 100, 200 years. And the only way we can really answer that question is to have high quality data from, from, from times gone by. So what we're looking at here is a Google Earth plot showing all of the weather observations that are available to climate scientists today for um, sometime in October 1987. So this is about, this is about uh, 30 years ago, um, 25 years ago. What we're looking at here, the, the, the every point on this globe is a, a, a weather reading that we can use. And we're focusing in over, over Europe here. We can see the color of the dot, the blue of the dot, uh, the lower the pressure is. So what's actually happening here is there's a big storm over the south of England, and you can see that there's very low pressure uh, um, over over the south of England. If we take that data and feed it into a, a, a large simulation of what the weather was like across the whole globe, then we end up with a model, and this is the model that is produced from these data. Now we're overlaying the lines, the fixed lines are isobars, so measures of pressure. The black arrows are wind speed. And what we're seeing here is a model of, uh, of, of the weather uh, across, across the whole of the Earth. And the, the model produces uh, kind of a kilometer square grid of, uh, of uh, resolution um, for, with a timestamp of every hour. So it produces this very, this very uh, uh, rich, uh, um, um, a model basically that can be tested against the data that we have. If we go to the southern hemisphere uh, at the at the uh, at the same point in time, hopefully, where is where is the southern hemisphere slide? 
doesn't seem to be there. Okay, no problem. Uh, the southern hemisphere slide uh, it doesn't matter. If we go to the uh, same time in uh, old weather era, so this is uh, this is now in 1919, so about the time of that HMS New Zealand uh, image. Um, a lot of we're looking at. We can now see that there's this uh, there's this kind of uh, can you see this kind of cloud that's coming up over the North Atlantic. This is what the climate scientists call the fog of ignorance. So this is where there is a uh, there's a not very good certainty in the results that they uh, they have in their model. So there's there's uncertainty in the model, and you can see that that uncertainty overlaps with where um, there's no data. So that's pretty understandable. If we go to the southern hemisphere 100 years ago, this fog of ignorance now extends all the way basically over the Antarctica, all the way over the southern oceans. So basically, we don't really know what the weather was like 100 years ago in, in, the, in the southern oceans. And so this is a problem if we're trying to work out well, whether there's been changes in the, last, in the last century. And these are data from old weather. So all of these positions here now that we're plotting are positions that have been recovered from the old weather logbooks that we were showing you in the uh, I was showing you in the screen back before. So every point here is a position that comes from the logbooks. You'll have to excuse the odd uh, positional error where there's a ship that appears to be in the middle of the Sahara. That's not uh, that's obviously not uh, not real. But you can see that basically these data cover a broad fraction of the globe. So these data can be used to go uh, every point that we have here. We have six weather observations that can go into these into these data models and so we can we can take these data and they're used and they're going to be I think the next simulation runs I think they run about once a year so I think the next simulation runs in October next year so you know there's this this fantastically rich data set that can be fed into these data models okay so I think it's worth just taking just a couple of minutes just to say sort of why why the people um, contribute their time to our projects. And I think I think um, this was a big question for us. When we when we first launched Galaxy Zoo, we, we thought that maybe people would really enjoy looking at pictures of galaxies. That was probably a little bit naive, but we didn't really know whether people would be interested in the science that we wanted to do, for example. So after the first version of Galaxy Zoo, we put out a survey. So the people who responded to the survey were invited to come back for a second version of Galaxy Zoo. So this is a biased subset of the community. It's the most committed core of the community, if that makes sense. So that, you know, taking that into account, there's still value of understanding what people were, uh, 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 people's motivations were. So what we're looking at here are the responses to, um, to a single question from, from the survey. And the question was, what is your primary motivation for contributing your time to Galaxy Zoo? Um, there were lots of categories going from the right. There was, I like science, I like astronomy, um, I'm interested in the scale of the universe, I'm an artist. But if we go to the, um, the large spike on the left, this is, uh, I see value in contributing to research. So we had a community of people who overwhelmingly were interested in, in the research that we were going to do with their efforts and with the classifications that they were providing. And so that really, really leads us on to uh, where we are today with this, with the Zooniverse today. The Zooniverse today is a collection of citizen science projects. Today I've just shown you a couple of them, Galaxy Zoo and Old Weather, but we now have about 12 projects live and ranging, things ranging from diverse as uh, finding exoplanets going around other stars to uh, transcribing ancient Greek papyri. The, the kind of running thread through all of these projects, though, is that they all have a research case. They're all projects that are very difficult or impossible to take on in any other way. And they rely upon, typically rely upon a, a method of engaging the public, but then also engaging the public in a way where we can uh, have maybe repeat classifications to build confidence in the, in the certainty of the, the results that we're collecting, or, 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 some other, or some other methods to ensure that we are producing good, good quality results. So this is, you know, this is a way of doing science that we think is really very exciting, and, uh, and this, is, this, is, this is our kind of favorite mode of doing stuff now.
And so, the uh, just to answer the question, uh, actually, uh, uh, just came up. Uh, where is the data compiled? So we collect all the classifications, the clicks that people produce back into a database, and depending on the sort of technical expertise of the individual science teams, we will either help them with the data reduction and, an and analysis, or we will sometimes send them um, the raw database, and they will uh, do the analysis themselves. So it really depends upon the technical abilities of, of the team. Um, this, this idea of engaging members of the public, you know, people having time to give to help something that isn't immediately of value to them, I think is really interesting. And, and it has a name. Uh, it's called Cognitive Surface. And there's a, there's a book about this written by a chap called Clay Shirky. And I think if you want to kind of get an idea of um, broadly the kind of space that I think the universe operates in, I think this is where we fit. You know, people don't have to give their time to Zooniverse and to the science project, but people do, and it's um, some spare brain cycles that they might have. And you know, the thing about cognitive synthesis is sometimes you just want to sit down at the end of a long day, you just want to watch TV. But other times, maybe you have, you know, you're, you're interested in solving a problem, you're interested in helping science, so you, 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 you dedicate some time to, to helping scientists solve problems. And that's, I think, what Zooniverse captures. In terms of how much of this there is, just to give you an idea of the potential for more projects like this, I think it's enormous. This, this is a plot from a blog called Information is Beautiful, which uh, produces rather um, beautiful infographics showing, trying to visualize data. And I think this is one of the best, just because of its simplicity. This is uh, the number of hours spent by the US public uh, watching TV every year. And it's about 200 billion hours. That's big block on the left. And on the right here, we've got uh, the 100 million hours, that tiny little cube down on the right there, the 100 million hours it took to create all of the content on Wikipedia. And I think there's something really rather stunning about that. Uh, and so, you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity to, uh, to tap some of this cognitive surplus. It's not, you know, it's not to say that it's all for doing science, but if we can uh, capture a little bit more of that, then uh, 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 then that would be that would be pretty exciting. In terms of Zooniverse on this scale, I think we're probably about a pixel on the screen on your computer monitor right now in terms of how much cognitive surface we have we have tapped. So that's just a thought to leave you with. Uh, but that's pretty much it. So thanks for your time. Um, I've been trying to answer some questions as I go along, but I'll turn the mic back uh, to to uh, the moderators, and I'd uh, love to love to hear your thoughts. Thanks, Arpan. This is Marge Robinson, and um, I have some questions for you. Uh, the first would be that uh, as citizen science uh, implies that uh, non-scientists will be involved in the creation of science and its application, what skills and habits of mind would you like to see emphasized in educating the public for this new role? That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, I think we we build our projects um, such that they, you know, people can succeed by being human. Honestly, that's all we hopefully rely upon. We, you know, we try to build projects that rely upon human intuition. Um, Pattern recognition, for example, is something that most of us are very, very, very good at. Nature has made us that way. And so saying something about the shape of the galaxy just relies upon uh, sort of native abilities of, a, 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 of, of somebody with, with, you know, with an with a optic nerve and a, and a brain connected on the other end. In terms of um, the broader scale of citizen science, I think, you know, I think these projects are um, one of the most exciting sort of kind of meta uh, uh, points about citizen science is I think they can only if you can if you can give people uh, an idea of how you're taking their efforts and producing science from them I think that very quickly gets into the territory of understanding the nature of science and process of science and how you maybe can take the you know the collective abilities of a group of group of volunteers and produce a good result from that. So I think that introduces nature of science arguments and 
uh, and, and statistics at its most basic level, really. Um, I think how can we train people to be better and more prepared for this? I think yeah, we, I think we have. Um, I think if this could get more people engaged in science and the sciences and mathematics, I think that would be. I think that would be a great thing. But hopefully, we can just uh, uh, you know the, the, we can. If we can capture people's attention and get them inspired by the subject matter, then um, then maybe they can kind of grow with the project. Um, there's also um, uh, um, Gary's asked a question: Is universal collaboration of international scope? Um, uh, yeah, so there's lots of um, there's institutions in the UK, uh, the US, uh, and uh, one in Switzerland actually. So primarily US and UK. So I'm actually sitting in Chicago right now. Arfan, um, I wonder if you uh, see a role for citizen science uh, in the schools themselves. Yeah, I think I think I do. Um, I we we know that some of our projects are um, being used in the classroom. Um, I think the challenge to to us, really, is to help make that as easy as possible. Um, my my wife is a is a teacher, and I understand the you know the pressures really that teachers face in terms of keeping content uh, in you know aligned with a given curriculum for a given state or a given county in the UK or something. You know, curriculum focus is is always so so important, and so. You know, usually our projects have been used as kind of breakout sessions, that are something a little bit different. But I, I really think that the most creative examples I've seen are when um, projects have been used maybe in a maths lesson because we're trying to teach, um, we're trying to teach statistics, or maybe just a, a just a just a random a random connection where you can talk about citizen science, you can talk about uh, with deep classifications, you can talk about how this might work under the hood, and it doesn't have to be immediately applied uh, to the content matter that's in the classroom. So, you know, that relies upon teachers knowing about the project. I think so far we've we've put some um, we've put some effort into that, but it's a lot of work to really work out how to. You know, we've been writing lesson plans to try and kind of give people give teachers something that they can just pick up and use. And so I think the onus is on us to really try and communicate what we're doing uh, and produce some resources around what we do. But I think potentially I think the idea of doing, like being in the classroom and seeing real science happening rather than kind of toy science like can happen sometimes in the school classroom, so I think kids are really quick to pick up on the fact that they're doing something that's been done a thousand times before them and you know, why is it relevant. So. You know, I think you know there's some authentic kind of experience that potentially can be offered in citizen science. I think could be a really powerful motivator in the classroom. Thank you. Uh, we've had a little conversation going on about social entrepreneurship uh, coming out of the book that you mentioned. Um, I wondered if you wanted to add anything to that. Sure. Sorry, I was just uh, I was just uh, pulling pulling up uh, um, um, the 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 comments. Yeah, I think um, I think whether this um, I think people who contribute a lot of time to citizen science projects are um, are engaging, are seeing, are, are probably seeing the kind of broader goals of of citizen science, which is um, coming back to some of the terms that. Uh, Clay Shirky uses in in his book um, around kind of civic activities, um, so citizen science being something for the greater good of society. And I think, yeah, I think I think it's I think they're definitely in the same space. And I think um, you know you know science the best the, the furthering of scientific knowledge I think is is something of civic value. So I think yeah I think I think uh, I think citizen scientists as a citizen scientist may be uh, you know. Uh, maybe social entrepreneurs as well. Um, in your work so far with Galaxy Zoo, 
What have been the greatest challenges? Uh, I think initially um, working out how to make the best of people's time, so the best of people's, like, how to do the most uh, kind of efficient data reduction was a big challenge. Um, I think beyond that, our main focus really has been over the past over the past couple of years, we've run out of the really easy, beautiful galaxies. Um, so we've actually started to put in. I think Galaxy Do has become harder over the last few years, and I think maintaining a sort of maintaining that balance between something that's actually hopefully fun or at least interesting and something that people aren't alienated by because it feels just way, way, way too hard is is a continual kind of uh, line that we're trying to uh, uh, balance on really. It's, 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 the challenge is more about how to make the task um, fun and, 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 and realistic for, for a non, typically a non-trained audience, if that makes sense. You know, we don't have a group of people who come to Galaxy Zoo who are professional scientists. So it is, it's, it, yeah, it's just a, it's just keeping in mind the audience and the subject matter. And it, in a way, you know, one of the, as a, as a scientist, I'm in many ways really quite obsessed with the idea how hard can we make these problems where people will still succeed. But at the same time, that is not necessarily the right approach to take. So. Right. Um, the gold standard for scientific research, uh, especially in medical science, has been double-blind randomized trials. With the advent of big data sets that are not necessarily randomized, uh, are new statistical techniques needed and are being used? Can you give us any feedback on that? Sure. So we haven't actually, um, I mean, we haven't kind of gone in, in any kind of very particularly strong direction with new statistical methods for how we how we assess um, how we assess how good people are in the task. What we are doing more these days is we're trying to be much better at modeling um, the individual abilities of a of a of a person. Um, we we've had in the past a very static model of how good you are at classifying. So if you, um, if you came to Galaxy Zoo um, maybe three times over a year, maybe you got better at Galaxy Zoo over that time, but we actually only ever gave you kind of a single score, an authority score, if you like, that was used, that was convolved in with the, with the scoring of the, uh, with the, with, it, with your, what you said, it was given a weighting based on your score. What we're doing now, a lot of our attention is being placed on how to better, how to be more, have a kind of dynamic model about the individual uh, and their abilities. And also to separate out, you know, you might not be very good at counting spiral arms, but you might be very good at saying which direction they're going in. So there's, there's lots of different questions in Galaxy Zoo, and you might be very good at some of them and bad at others. And so building methods, building data reduction strategies that are sensitive to that is actually really quite an interesting problem and it's one that we've been working with um, with uh, some computer scientists uh, in the robot robotics group at, uh, at University of Oxford and with um, University of Washington here in the US. So, so uh, I, don't, I don't have anything more really to say than that other than I think the real challenge for us is to how we're always trying to amplify the kind of the, the signal from the noise in, in, in the data that we collect. Okay. Um, do you have any data on uh, how much time uh, people typically uh, put into the citizen projects? Yeah, so um, I think one of the things that we know about our community is, you know, there's, there's kind of um, broadly three distinct groups. Um, there's people who you know, visit once, so they come to a project, maybe they heard about it on NPR or they read about it in the newspaper. They visit once, 
to click around for maybe maybe only 10 seconds, uh, and maybe they go away. They never come back. So there's, you know, there's people who just did it quickly, go away. A challenge for us then with those people is to, can we do science with 30 seconds of your time if you never come back again? So that's always something, the answer is not always yes, but sometimes it is, and I think the original Galaxy Zoo succeeded in that. That you, that you could, it took probably only 10 seconds to classify a galaxy, and then you could have a go at it really quickly. So that was that's always an interesting design design goal. Um, then there's people who um, maybe are are engaged for some length of time on a project, so they um, you know, they they visit at least um, they visit at least once. Uh, uh, um, uh, and probably uh, probably visit three, four, five times uh, over um, a week, and maybe you know that spectrum kind of extends to people who engage for extended periods and start discussing in in the kind of forum communities and actually become active participants in the wider project. There's then um, a, a, a term that's used internally by some of the education researchers here at the Adler Planetarium who say, as they call them. People meta users, so people who really deeply engaged in the idea of citizen science. They've almost certainly contributed their time across a number of Zooniverse projects rather than just an individual one. They actually may spend the majority of their time in the community helping people uh, rather than doing the core science task. But they really identify strongly with the projects, and so so there's yeah there's. The, Broadly, they're the kind of three groups of people that, that contribute their time to to universe projects. Thank you. And I think uh, my final question, other people may have some more, but uh, my final question is where can people get involved? So if you go to zooniverse.org, so Z O O N I V. E R S E. I could type that in, can't I? Zooniverse.org. Uh, uh, you can find uh, this collection of projects, um, and yeah, we've got things. We've got about twelve live projects now, uh, and we've got a collection of. Uh, we're always we're always cooking up new ideas and and producing new science projects. So uh, yeah, we'd love to we'd love to have uh, love to have you all help out. Great, that's terrific. I'm very interested. Um, I see that Mark has also asked um, whether you have any thoughts on how we can get our students involved at the college level. Yeah, so I mean, we have um, you know we have a way um, in a couple of the projects to set up um, groups. So you can set up um, uh, groups of people, and you can classify as a group. It's actually a uh, a tool that we built that we call the Galaxy Zoom Navigator, uh, which allows you to do um, really, uh, I, I would say, sort of some statistics lessons really around uh, the, the shapes of galaxies. I've just copied the link in to that. Um, so if you classify as a group, you can make groups, you can invite people to join you, and you can uh, classify as a group and then see how your galaxies how your classifications compare with everyone else's in the community. So, so you you can invite. Um, uh, you know, I think that's that's a that's a way for kind of sort of a, uh, uh, to just a kind of first efforts on our end to try these sort of uh, facilitated kind of learning experience around some of the projects. But we've got tons of ideas and more stuff we could do. I think uh, we always always want to hear your ideas. But I mean, these projects are designed for anybody to take part. So uh, you know, we'd, I'd love for you to be. Advocates for citizen science to to your students and, and to to really encourage people to take part. So I think it's there's something very uh, there's something very uh, um, exciting about um, seeing seeing people suddenly have that kind of moment where they realise that actually what they're working on isn't just a, a toy problem. It's actually real science and it's something something that they're contributing to. So yeah, just be advocates for citizen science. That would be amazing.